Hi, it's Nikki, and thank you so much for stopping by because it's uh, it's really hard to find a podcast to listen to these days, isn't it? Not. Uh, I think you'll like this though. It's called "Be Someone, Not Everyone," and you're going to meet some really, really fascinating people. I'm not looking for super famous people, so don't think that she's going to come and sit next door to me. Well, she might. Who knows? But what I was looking for um, is people that have had a life, had a bit of adversity, and come out all the better for it. So get yourself a pot of tea, sit yourself down, and I hope you enjoy it. See you in a bit. Can't tell you how many times I've clicked flipping record and not actually, uh, I am clicked record no. halfway through. Hiya. Thanks for coming. Another little podcast of mine. Be someone, not everyone. And today's guest does look like she's just come back from three week in Barbados. We've just been laughing. And me, still white as a sheet, we actually look like a licorice all sort stood next to each other, sat next to each other here. But um, there's some people that just, and I, I don't like, particularly like that word, inspire, because it's very overused. But there's some people that make your heart jump a little faster every time you see an email from them, a message for them, or see anything that they've been doing. Because, and we've just been talking about it, perception and reality are quite often very different things. So this woman has got a freaking story to tell, and we're just gonna hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jill Evans. <laughs> oh, Jill, hiya, thank you. We met, cause I went to work for you about oh, five years ago that now, isn't it? Mm, longer, longer. It? Mm. And we always had that bond. Well, yes, because Noah had just been born. Absolutely, yeah, it is a little bit longer. So, Life has changed for you a little bit from those days. Tell us about what you were doing and then tell us about what your life-changing pivotal event was. I was working in graphic design and my other half, Colin, had this graphic design company and you came along and uh, spoke to our staff there, which was great. And I was generally sort of busy going on holiday, out networking most nights generally kind of businessy um and that's what i love doing and that's what i was doing and then um and then we decided to we were going to have kids and i was pregnant and it was all plain sailing and then out of the blue suddenly seven weeks early waters broke and um i whizzed into hospital um fully on the phone to uh, Diane who was helping to look after my work saying maybe you need to hold the meetings for a couple of days <laughs> um not realizing quite how long we'd need those meetings held for but yeah um that was it Noah was born by emergency cesarean the next morning um not breathing and that was when our world totally changed you must have gone into kind of a shock tell us tell us what happened well i sort of you know went to the hospital and presuming that i think you go to hospitals and presume that they're going to sort of make you better or it's going to be all right once you get there and they were clearly monitoring me and things weren't all right and the right at the last minute at about 10 to 5 um in the in the afternoon they'd said that they needed to take me down for this scan this special scan to check that the baby had got enough blood supply and um and they said oh we're just about to shut the scan room and the um guy the, it was a male midwife that was there he said you need to get this girl down right now he said it's really important and had he not have said that i just I just don't even know what would have happened. It would have been a different story. And um, I went down for the scan and they did the scan and um, and they just said, right, baby's got to come out. So by a uh, couple of hours later, um, I was just um, into medical clothing and wheeled on a trolley and Radio One was on 
um, <laughs> in the operating theatre and he was out within one song that was on. I, I remember the song, it was like a nightclub song. <laughs> and, what um, was it? What were the song? Oh, I can't, I can't just remember, but every time it comes on, I think, oh yeah. yeah. Um, and I just watched uh, One Born every 60 seconds and I thought, oh yeah, Caesarean, I know what that is, it'll be all right, they do it all the time. Um, mm. And then they was, he was born really fast. And um, I, you know, I thought they came and sort of gave you the baby then, um, but they just sort of fleetingly showed him and then uh, whizzed him off. And I could see everybody looking at each other and more people were piling into the room and you know, Colin was sat with me and he was sort of looking over and, and I just thought that's maybe what happened. It was all a bit of a, a surreal moment, really. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise. And um, anyway, it was clear that he, he wasn't breathing and they were working on this baby to get him back. There must have been, I mean, I mean, I just mentioned the word shock before because, I mean, everybody's frightened when they go in. It was your first baby, everybody's, you know, is understandably frightened. But was it like a numbness? Because, I mean, you could never have been prepared for what came after, which, you know, tell us about that. But you, there must have been a, a numbness. Were you able to talk to Colin at that time when you realised, actually, things are going freaking desperately wrong here? This is not like I read in a law magazine. You yeah. Know, could, were you able to speak to Colin at that time? Or were you both in such a shock that you actually couldn't even express Colin knew more than I did what was going on because he had the eye contact with the um, with the nurses over at the other side of the room when where they had Noah and um, I, I was just it, it, everything just sort of went so fast that you know I didn't really even know what was going on mm. uh, and then he just you know Noah just left the room with people he'd gone off that they'd intubated him so he was onto a ventilator straight away. And um, he just went off to special care baby and we, we didn't see him for ages. And I went into the recovery room. And then um, once I'd come round and I was back in the, um, in my little room, um, the doctor came in, the pediatrician uh, the consultant, and he said, um, he said, do you know, um, do you know he's, he's not well? And I said, uh, I said, well, yeah, you know, I've not, I'd not been to see him at that point. And he said, um, and I said, well, you know, how, how unwell? And he said, well, um, at the time when he was born, he said, we, we were sort of fighting minute to minute. I said, right. And I said, what is it now? And he said, well, it's hour to hour. And I thought, you know, just, I had no idea. What, what, what had happened? Tell us what, what, what was the problem? Well, they didn't know at the time, but Noah has a rare type of um, interstitial lung disease, which we didn't know for about three months of investigation. And um, without going into technicalities, it, it's a big breathing issue. Um, he also, which has only just come to light in the last few months, has a brain um, abnormality as well, which he will have always had since in the womb. And that his his brain doesn't signal properly to the breathing so obviously all of those things just didn't kick in um we didn't know that for some time but at the time that he was born it was just at our local district general um in in halifax and you know it's a bit like uh, the, you know the staff are great there but it's a bit like going to your gp you know the general hospital and so they didn't have any facilities for children that were as sick and um unstable as as Noah is so you you went from there to Walder here yeah tell us yeah. what happened there we went from there to Walder Hay um in Liverpool which was just the best place to be um because we could stay there we we actually had only gone for a little scope a little telescope down his throat to see what the problem was so we thought we were only going for a day and actually we stayed for 10 and a half months. <laughs> that, jumper mu that jumper must have been a bit rank by, 
<laughs> I'm going, do you know what? I've had this on every day for ten and a half months, darling. You still look gorgeous. Um, so we went there. Um, it was great because they do loads of research there, and the doctors were really interested. You know, they see some of the sickest kids in Europe there. Mm. And, um, you know, we went, and again, I thought, oh, this is great. Uh, we got their massive um, pediatric intensive care and I thought right this is this is where they're going to know what to do and then um, it became clear that you know we were in safe hands but um, you know they didn't know and it was just um, have a have a seat it's a little bit like when your car goes in and it's a really old car and they're like um, right, well, I think it might be this, I'll have a go. And then it wasn't that. So they went through all these investigations. Yeah. Um, and, and thank goodness we were there. We, we lived on site. It was a bit like being in uh, student halls. You know, we had a room and could get a shower, yeah. community, make a cup of tea. So I've just seen, uh, I've just seen a, a video of you talking, which I am going to put up with this because you should be a professional speaker. I tell you what, you're 10 times better than I could ever dream of being, how you held that room. But I guess there's pivotal moments in your life that you'll never forget. And you're talking about Colin and it was birthday and you were walking around all the hill like a big treat to take Noah out in his push chair. I do not know how you lived through what happened there. I really do. How you both just didn't end up on the floor. So after about, well, this was August now. So Noah was born in March. So it was quite a few months on and we still didn't yeah. really know what was wrong. But he was a bit more stable and it was Colin's birthday. So we were allowed to put him in the pram and go with our nurse um for a walk around the hospital grounds which you think that's good because it's like at the hospital and um, what you don't realize is when you're in the car park you can't just go and quickly press a crash bell or we didn't have phones we didn't have a phone with us so we may as well have been in the middle of nowhere really. yeah. <laughs> so we'd, we'd set off and um and we had um some oxygen on the pram and we also had a a SATS monitor so you could see his heart rate and not all the rest of it attached and it was a really nice day it was sunny and when you um when you were looking at the monitor you couldn't see it because of the sun and I said to the nurse how will we know if he's all right because can't see the monitor and she said well uh, she said if he's not all right it'll be the same color as that little rabbit that he's got with him it was blue this rabbit so we'd had a little laugh about it and then we walked, carried on walking around the hospital. And then all of a sudden, he's gone, just, just gone. And um, like he was the same colour as the rabbit and he was getting darker and darker. It was just, it was just awful. And um, the nurse, obviously we'd been trained, but, you know, looking after somebody's airway is something that all the doctors were doing then. We had been trained in it. We didn't really know how you actually did it. And the nurse usually has loads of backup and she thought, oh, well, they've been trained. I'm here for support. And so she just started to scream. He's arrested. Get him out of the pram. So Colin got him out of the pram and put him on the floor. There was nobody around. And she said, somebody's got to go for help. So I just didn't want to stay. And the bizarre thing was Colin's the runner. <laughs> he can <laughs> run fast. <laughs> Off I set in flip-flops. Um, like screaming as somebody helped me and everybody was just looking at me like I'd gone do lally and I eventually got to a building and um they phoned the crash call um and then you know ambulances came doctors were running out of the hospital to get him and by the time I'd run back um there was all sorts of people around him they, they'd got him back but it, you know it, Noah had many respiratory arrests in the hospital, but you can almost get them back uh, yeah. if you act quick enough. But this was some time and it was awful. And, and even when we got home, I really relived that over and over. And I had um, this EMDR therapy in the end, which massively helped. Um, but even when we were back at home, um, obviously had the monitors on him all the time 
and they bleep all the time. You know, if he turns over, they bleep. It's it's often not a big deal. Mm. But I was so anxious, so on edge every time it bleeped. I was like Linford Christie up the stairs to check on him, even though he was with a nurse. So it had really long implications for us. Yeah, I, you know, I totally understand that as well. Uh, I mean, a, a very different thing. But of course, I took a phone call at work to say mm. that my first little boy had died and I jumped fucking 10 feet in the air every time I had a phone ring for years. Mm. And to be fair, I still do. I still mm. don't like hearing phones ring. And it, it is strange. I mean, it's strange what those pivotal moments leave you with. Mm. What, what's the MDR therapy, just quickly? EMDR, it's, um, it's not hypnosis, but it's a rapid eye movement therapy. So you sort of go like this with the doctor that's trained in it and you relive the moment. Right. And I was sat in his office and he said, oh, we'll relive this car park moment. And he said, right, you know, how do you feel on a level of one to 10 about it? And I was like, well, 10. And so after I'd said the whole, I had to relay the whole thing loads. And after about an hour, he said, well, how do you feel about it now? And I said, well, I feel all right about it because I'm just sat in your office. I'm, you know, I'm not there. And he said, well, it's all right now. And it's when um, your brain needs to process it and move it over or something so that it's then done. Mm. And so now, you know, I, I've had to resuscitate Noah at home since then with no nurses or anything here. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not good at all. Uh, really not. But I, you know, it's afterwards that I thought, oh my God, you know, at least then I could hold it together whilst doing the tasks, if you like. We talk about perception, because I look at you and I think, how could you be calm and just do what you have to do when you're doing that for your child? And yet you will tell me, I'm sure, that reality and perception are different things. And it's like, just going back to when my son died, everybody said, I don't know how you can be you. I don't know how you can be back at work two days later. But reality for me was that it's like literally somebody came and got hold of my arm and assisted me. And it was almost like an ethereal, an angelic moment that it wasn't me. It wasn't me alone. Somebody were helping me. I, I mean, I don't really, I don't, I don't know how you do it. Tell us, do you have that moment? Do you think you're on your own with it? What, what is this? I can't imagine it. When we were um, about to leave the hospital, when we'd been there all those months, it's a bit like lockdown, really. It's a bit like, a bit like now. Um, you know, you, we were in a bit of a um, bubble there because I had everybody there. And because many times he was having to have resource. Mm. Um, it was unstable when we were going home, but you couldn't stay there forever. And I said, I can't, I can't go. I can't do that because what happens at hospital is they press a panic button and all these people come running and you know you're sort of moved to the side whilst they deal with the child and I didn't know how I was gonna do that you know these people had all been to university for so long mm. and they had a big meeting and the um, lead consultant said look Jill you've asked every possible question I like to uh, I like to have everything covered <laughs> <laughs> You've asked every possible question. He said, at the end of the day, all that happens is they do this and they squeeze this bag and they press on the chest and you can do that as well as any of these doctors. And he said, um, you know, we don't always know that we can save him. All we can do is that. He said, and you know how to do that on your own. And, and when I came back, um, as I say, I, you know, he was unstable and I was a nervous wreck. <laughs> um, but, but over time, and certainly after I had that, that treatment, um, you know, I can never remember actually at the time what I've just done, what tasks I've mm. just done when I've had to do something major like that. But, you know, it just, it said, the doctor said, you just have to keep it in the back of your mind and know that that's what you need to do. Those are the tasks. He said, and until you need those tasks, you've just got to, live so yeah. I thought, right. and your whole perception of living has changed mm. your whole idea of what life is has changed 
Tell us about that and tell us what your situation with Noah is now. What's your old my flight? It's seven. Yeah. No, he's older now. He's oh, um, he's nine, and he's oh, he? Oscar. Um, so our home life is like really crazy. Um, he's, he's he is a normal child who has additional need of having somebody with him just in case anything bad happens. Um, you know, they're currently playing on the Xbox and they'll uh, run rings around me all day, um, taking advantage of me. We're always out, we're everywhere um, when it's not lockdown time. Um, I just really felt at the time that, um, you know, life was for living and you should just seize every moment. And, you know, we were living in the hospital and you literally did not know each day what you were going to go back to and some of my best friends um were at the hospital at the time and they haven't got their children anymore mm. and some of them have some of them haven't and i just think and I, I understood straight away at the time that you know you could probably go one way or the other and many people say to me you know is he not in bed all the time you know attached to machines and he could he could be and people told me that he'd never walk, he would never talk, never eat food, he was just tube fed. And I thought, right, well, um, I'll just offer him the very best and as much as I can push him to do, he should do. So he goes to mainstream school with his carer. He, um, he goes um, into the swimming pool with me. Um, consultants would be like, what? You know, if I dropped him, all that water would be in his lungs, it would be game over. But you know, everybody else swims and he wants to have a go. So I take him in the sea. Um, he's always running around in the in woods. Um, I love the outdoors. I think that's really important. We really uh, like going to the National Coal Mining Museum. And if you've, uh, if you've not been there, you go down. Um, it's as far down as Blackpool Towers High. Um, and it wasn't until there was me um, on my own with both kids going down this lift with the miner and we got to the bottom and it was kind of pitch black you just have the head torch on and I thought something happens now <laughs> I'm really on my own you know they can't ring an ambulance but I just thought do you know what I've had the training just this is great for these boys and what a what a journey I've been on to get to that level and if anybody would have told me that that day in the car park you know, that day, I, I wouldn't even, I didn't wear flip-flops for about six months because I couldn't run fast in them. Um, the, uh, I wouldn't let the nurse leave the room just in case. I wouldn't pick him up from the bed in case he did it again and I couldn't get him in the bed quick enough. And to go from that to, to this, you know, I take a bit of a risk sometimes, but they're always calculated risks. I think you should take a lot of credit for it as well and and I mean the other thing is uh, we uh, how did you feel when you were having Oscar and you'll have no privacy at home I mean uh, there will be no privacy that for me would be the thing I you know when did you and Colin last go out on a date night or have any time together or and and that's you know as you've been talking I've been thinking as all this brought you two closer together or you probably don't want to answer this in front of however many people, but it could, things like this either bring you closer together or they make it really difficult. It's really strange because like you say, with having people in your house all the time, um, we have um, about, in normal times and not, I, not lockdown times, we usually have a, about 15 hours a day of care. So we have awake, overnight every night and we have um people in the day um because you can't leave him in a room on his own because if something happened and his tracheostomy tube was to block he can't shout out and say i need a hand you'd not know so somebody's got to be with him all the time so you do have to have help but these people are people that you know they come and go and um you know i can choose to an extent to i have in that if I really don't like somebody, then I don't have them. Um, but they're not people that you'd 
choose to be mates with you know mm. and it's a bit bizarre because they're sat in your kitchen whilst you're having breakfast and we might Colin and I might be talking about work or we might be talking about something personal you we know might you be having a row well I was going to say you can't really have a row well you can but like I cringe not till you get him in garden <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's, it is difficult I mean people like either split up or or make it kind of thing and I think you've just got to have a really strong bond I mean our relationship has certainly really changed from what it was when we were going away on those holidays you know we really depend on each other you know even if we've had a row or something about work there's only me and him that ever know how we made it through things like that car park situation or all those other things, you know, and that night after the car park, as I say, it was Colin's birthday. So we, we were going out for tea at this little restaurant. And then um, we both sat and cried through the entire meal. The people in the restaurant must have thought, what on earth? But, you know, there's only him that would know how we both felt then. And so it's so nightmare having people in your house all the time. It's been lovely in lockdown, actually, because I've, really cut back on them because I don't want people here with germs kind of thing. It no would be very poorly if you got coronavirus. Mm. Um and it's actually been lovely just the four of us being in the house. You know, it's not suitable long term, but but it's been good and yeah. It's just you different. know and you won't know this Jill, but um so you've got this amazing company called Race Skin and my son had ordered some my son goes out on his bike and he'd ordered some biking trousers. I don't know what they're called. <laughs> um and it, you know, he's a bit more muscular than we thought, and we needed larger, not medium. And I dropped these, you won't know this, but I dropped the the bag with the trousers in outside your house, and I just happened to look in and Noah was sat at the kitchen breakfast bar. And I looked at him for a second and I thought, oh God, I'll have to go because if he turns around and sees <laughs> me looking at window, like he's gonna start screaming. But there were just a piece about that boy and the situation. And it really hit me for a second. It quite took me back. I don't know what I were expecting. I did meet Noah when he was very small. I don't know what I were expecting, but there was just a piece around the situation that quite caught, caught me unawares. He's just such a normal boy. I mean, he knows that he's different in that he has people with him all the time with loads of equipment. You, you walk around with all that stuff that ambulance people carry. Mm. Um, but he's, he's such a pleasure to be with. And because he's, um, because he's been surrounded by adults all the time as well, he's, he's a bit different. He doesn't mix with kids quite the same. Um, but with adults, you know, he would love to come on your Zoom calls and uh, he, he loved watching you go for walks in the woods in the morning. Uh, you know, an adult humour is funny. Um, it's just it's just a normal, a normal boy. And and that's why I think it's so important that he has everything. And he has, you know, I tell him that he can do anything in the world that he wants. And I truly believe that that he can. And you know, we've done so many things, you know, he's had a lot of opportunities and it's because it is because I've pushed for it, but also because of different charities we've been involved in. But, you know, he's had fire stations open so that he can go for the day and play and not have to go after an hour. We've done, um, you know, we went to Disneyland. We had loads of support to do that. We, um, we've done just all sorts, um, going in a speedboat you know he just loves the whole thrill of it and and I think you know he's so lucky my boys are so lucky they do stuff that other children just wouldn't do but you know he's not going to and you know touch wood and all that but if something happened tomorrow and he wasn't here I would never think I wish we'd have done that because we ju we just do everything every moment I think should just be joyful for them and if they're joyful than I am you know and what a lesson to everybody is that because none of us knew I never knew when I well long story I probably did but I none of us know whether we've got tomorrow with the people that we love and one of the things 
I know it's isn't about me, but a week after my son's funeral, I was sat with my then husband and father-in-law in Merry England in Uddersfield Market. And there was a woman sat across and she was berating this little three-year-old, three, four-year-old child. And she hit him and he went back like that. And you know those, they're in these, the, the, you're on like benches, aren't you there? And he hit his head back of his head and he was crying. And I literally were out of that chair and had hold of her before. And I'm going, I would do anything to take my child out for breakfast. Don't you realise what you've got? You look after that child. Don't ever, don't, don't ever berate him like that. And it does make you different. You know, I have no tolerance at all for any kind of cruelty. But I, 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 I want to tell people, you have no idea what you've got if you are blessed with children. You've got no idea. But the other thing, as you're talking, I mean, one, my God, you're absolutely right. But everybody thinks, when they hear that something like really perception, bad has happened, they don't imagine that you can have a laugh and have a drink and, be, and have those very joyous moments because mm. maybe it's made those moments, you appreciate them in a way that you would not normally have done if you hadn't have been subjected to a car park moment. You know, it's just a different journey. Our life is so, so different to how I pictured it was going to be. Um, you know, Colin had um, ideas that he was going to bring our kids up in a triathlon world, um, which they are to some extent, but, you know, no, we just watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they have. Your house is full of lycra, isn't it? Yeah, so. not on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, um, you know, uh, how I thought it was going to be, um, it's just a different a different route and and when I think what did I think it was going to be you know I probably thought we'd have a good business and some kids and they go to school and we go on a few holidays a year and do that but actually not that I would ever want um, Noah to be poorly but actually it's been rewritten so much nicer in a way because you know we do choose to do stuff that it makes us super happy and we can do stuff that um you know we probably wouldn't have done in the past and it's led to, led on to things that people just don't get to do um you know and and i you know for me i'm i'm just me that um you know i, I do work really hard in the day you know i stay up all night when the carer isn't there etc but that i'm just me to me but other people other parents that are in that position that um I was in when I was coming back from hospital are terrified you know I'm I'm in quite a lot of forums where they um <clears throat> where other parents hang out and they say you're such an inspiration that you do that and that you go these places and that you take him down the coal mining museum and I just think that's, you know, it's just me. I don't think it's an inspiration. I just think, you know, grab the bull by the horns and crack on, you know, and if, if that makes people think, wow, then good. Well, I think, wow. I think everybody, I think, wow, you know, because there's got to, you know, you're just brave. But I guess what are the options? You know, I, I, you either have, no matter how long your life is, and again, none of us know, You've got two choices. You freaking well do everything or you do nothing. Those are your choices, aren't they? You know, and I, I think that you've taken that extreme. Tell us about Well Child. So Well Child um, is a, the national charity for sick children. And I, um, I'm a parent ambassador of them. And when Noah was just born, what Well Child do is they uh, provide nurses that get really complicated children discharged quickly, basically. Um, so when you've got a child that's on a ventilator like Noah still is, and you've got oxygen, you've got to do all the training, you've got to sort your house out, you've got to um, have certain things in place, all of a sudden, all of your dietitians, occupational therapy, everybody changes because you're moving back home then. So what they do is they help to facilitate all that because like, like I said, it's, it's a different world, you know, it may as well be in a different language. You just, one minute I was doing meetings about graphic design visuals 
the next I'm keeping a child alive and having the house changed round. So that's what they do. And so, you know, I wanted to sort of give a bit back really, and I don't mind telling our story because it's interesting for people, um, you know, and it helps, helps other families. So Noah sort of turned a bit into a bit of a poster boy. He, he do not mind posing for a picture. And so we'd, um, you know, done a few pictures and a few little press items. And um, I do lots of things for Well Child. I'm a parent ambassador, as I said. So I'll organise like little meetups. We might go to the zoo or whatever and other families in the area come along. Um, quite often these families don't have other people that are in the same situation um, and it's really nice for them to be able to meet other families and it be, feel safe mm. I don't care you know Noah you've met Noah you know actually at a glance you wouldn't know that there was anything the matter really um, but some of these children look very sick and people don't like it if people are looking over and staring so they feel together when they're with people that are similar so we do that, which I love. And, um, and then I started to, um, to do the old bit of presentation and the speaking thing, um, which is just brilliant for me. I think they think that I do loads for them, but actually it's as much for me that I do it. Um, they'd, asked me, um, they'd asked me to say a few words at a, at a dinner once. And usually what happens is they have... Um, you know, there'd be a big corporate dinner and auctions and all sorts going on. And um, they have the uh, nominated charity and the charity guy gets up and, um, you know, has a bit of a PowerPoint presentation and they all have to give a bit of money. And I said, what if you had like a parent, you know? So they said, oh, wow, well, we'll give it, give it a go. You know, we've done it once, twice before. So I just... Um, you know, I'm allowed now to turn up at these fancy do's in a posh frock <laughs> and, um, and then just tell, the, tell our story. And it, it's not scary for me because nobody even ever did it wrong, you know, it's just, and it's just my life. And, and I just explain how well child has helped us and there's loads of stuff that they've done for us and how they help other families. And then seemingly people, um, can sort of almost put themselves in my position or realize that they can't put themselves in my position and how on earth do I do it and I don't know myself um but then they seem to just give loads of money so um so that's <laughs> so that's but, you're brilliant at it and and I think there's a there's a big element here isn't there for all these people that you that you help when it all kicked off for me and I know this isn't about me I just said can you just find me one person that this has happened to that have actually had a brilliant life, that have freaking well made some of themselves, that have looked back and said, that was terrible, but actually, my life, I've done it. You are that person to so many people because the last thing, those families that you're organizing those events for, the last thing that they will want is to have everybody with their head in their hands going, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. We know everybody's sorry. You know, we've got to make the best of it. And actually, you've proved that you can have one of the worst things that could happen to anybody. And you can still have an amazing, useful life. That's, that must be such a thing for so many people that you speak to. Well, I think, I think it is. Um... And like I say, for me, it's it's nothing unusual, you know. I was only talking to somebody last night on one of the forums. I'd sat up with Noah last night because our care is sick and she can't. They can't come if they're not well. And and you've been up all night and you're doing this today. <laughs> yeah, but I might have a snooze in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stop the next ten minutes. <laughs> no, all right. Um, and it must have been three in the morning, and she'd posted on this forum, and her little boy had been rushed into hospital. And for a start, there was numerous of, us, numerous of us up at three in the morning. And also, nobody knows what to say. You know, this child is sick. Mm. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not looking good. But you, sometimes you don't need people just to say, um, oh, you know, he's a fighter. Because <laughs> you think, well, 
you know, it might not go my way today. And so, you know, for a couple of hours, I was messaging her backwards and forwards and, you know, asking medical stuff or saying like, how, you know, have you got a coffee? You know, how are you doing? Is somebody with you? And, you know, and just talking in a language that she would talk to me in and, you know, that's really useful. And, and people are like that with me as well. And I remember when Noah was very, very poorly at the beginning uh, and I thought it, that his days were numbered and I just typed into Google like the condition and support groups and there was a girl that had answered an email and I just like sat there crying so relieved that there was just anybody that understood a little bit and I was just so relieved and so you know I don't go out of my way to do it but the thought that I can be that person for other people it, it makes me really happy that I can do that because it's important well it's an honor because it says so much about you and your strength and your capability and what you've turned around from what happened to you mm -hmm. so I know you've met Prince Harry a couple of times mm -hmm. tell, what's he like what's he like honestly it's the, it's the most fabulous guy it's he comes with an entourage of people. Um, and that would piss him off as well. You know, can you imagine everywhere you go, you're going to go with all these people? Oh. Well, you can, it's just different. Yeah, uh, but I mean, you would never know that he had the, you know, he, when you're talking to him, you'd never know that he had all these people with him. It's just like there's you and him in the room. Mm. Um, you know, a really funny story is I'd got a, an award um, for something that I'd done for Well Child. And so we were meeting him and the kids could come. And Oscar was only two at the time. And um, we needed to look quite nice to meet Prince Harry. And Oscar had this Batman outfit. <laughs> I couldn't get off him. I had Ribena all over it. I said, you can't, you can't wear that. Anyway, I, made, I had a little waistcoat made and some gorgeous boots and put Batman logos on the bottom and posted them to him as if Batman had sent them. And I said, he's asked you to wear this. Anyway, the minute Prince Harry walked into the room with all these other people that you needed to see, there was Oscar and Noah with his feet up in Prince Harry's face, <laughs> saying, look at the boots that Batman sent. And so Oscar then skipped around everybody, holding Prince Harry's hand as he oh. was swinging him. And I thought, what a nice guy. And he spoke to all these people like, you know, and how's it going, all the rest of it. Oscar swinging off his hand, he's just the nicest guy and and really, um, really passionate about well child and, and helping other kids. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll put a little link up to well child. Oh, thank you. Uh, at the end of this. Now, I'm going to, uh, so I wore this, I have worn this a couple of times. You'll recognise it in a minute because it's one of your race skin items. Oh, good great. Your world went mental, you know, with all this. I, I, and you run this really successful company, Rayskin, that we put a link up as well. And uh, and you started having these really trendy masks manufactured and it just went wild overnight. I mean, how you do everything you do and run this company. So I was filming in this and it does look, uh, it does look like a pair of fancy knickers. <laughs> I'm sure you that it isn't. But... I saw that when you when we shared this on Facebook, I mean, literally, it's gone mad. It's gone mad, hasn't it? Well, the story was, the reason that we ended up doing face masks, um, our company does triathlon clothing, com uh, custom triathlon and cycling clothing, because when we were sat in that hospital and we said, you know what, you should just do cool stuff all the time. So why are we working for a graphic design business that you know it was Colin's business I worked in it and it, you know it was nice but it was just just work mm. and so I said to Colin well what would you like to do he said well I'd like to do um, triathlon clothing he said because all the cool stuff's in America and I have to ship it over he said but all of the club stuff's dead boring he said so perhaps we could use our design talent do all the designing have the kit made um, out in Italy, it's lovely, really nice quality. Let's do that. So we did, and so that's what we did. And then coronavirus happened, 
and literally overnight all of the work dried up and we were like oh no because they cancelled all of the events this year so nobody wanted to buy anything so we thought what we're going to do and actually the factories that we um use for uh, to make the kit had been um taken by their governments of course they're a few weeks on from us and said right okay we've got all of the facilities do the highest quality face masks that you can do and we said well we're a few weeks behind you we might we might do that and you could supply it so they were like brilliant so we just did that instead um so yeah people have of- stopped me when i've been at supermarket people have stopped me asking me where i got that from honestly i knew that you'd have that one the leopard skin one <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and, and all my friends, I mean, honest to God, we all look the same when we go out <laughs> to the absolutely. Oh, well, absolutely. Do you know what? You are, and I, I know everybody says to it, but you're not only one of the most inspirational people, you're one of the kindest, you're one of the funniest. And when I did my free Zooms, I always, over lockdown, we're going to get back to them soon, but I always looked for your head on that little square <laughs> because I knew that I'd always at least have one person clapping. Uh, <laughs> you always emailed me after. And isn't it funny? It's hard to tell people at the time, but you will never know what that meant to me. So yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to tell us before, before we let you go and go get, go get some flipping sleep? <laughs> um, no, nothing else. Nothing else. Um, you know, it's amazing to me that people would say, I, you know, I just have said before, I was just a normal mom with a few different challenges. Who's had to go down a bit of a different route and, you know, to be able to come in and do this for, for your podcast, it's like really wow for me. Cause <laughs> oh God, don't get too excited. <laughs> there might only be me and our Danny that watch it. <laughs> Oh, well, anybody listening to this, you know, kids, no kids, business, no business, however they are, they've got to have taken something from you because you're brilliant. And the second we get out of these bubbles and lockdown and everything, (laughs) we, well, we'll have a little distance coffee. So thank you so much and lots of love to you. And I'll, well, I'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, that's it for another week. Hope you took something from that. Do you know what the thing is? If you just take one sentence that actually you learn something from or that makes you feel better, it's worth watching. If you liked it, subscribe down here. Even if you didn't like it, subscribe down here. And I'll see you next week. Take care until then. And again, thank you.